Let's start with a word of prayer. You can stand if you want or relax either way. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for your presence that you promise when we're gathered together to be with you, to worship you. And Lord, may your spirit rest upon us, empower us to praise you. May we just bring you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus, we thank you. We lift our hearts in praise. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. We lift our hearts. We lift our hearts in praise. Because it's you. It's you we love. It's you we worship. Cause it's you we love. It's you we worship.
Thank you for your presence. We thank you for the opportunity and privilege to sing your praises, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you made a way. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the last Wednesday for the year <laughs> until uh, until the fourth of uh, January. So uh, the next two Wednesdays will will be canceled. So spread the word <laughs> and keep us in prayer. The worship team has been really struggling with uh, sickness and you know sore throats and colds and Jen has you know lost her voice for the last month. So really struggling with it so uh, be in prayer for us so that we I'm looking forward to the kids getting out of school so that things can kind of calm down a little bit <clears throat> let's pray father we thank you for your word today Lord and uh, thank you again for your love and for your grace thank you for your presence Lord, we love your presence we love to be in your presence And so that we just, again, want to be still and know that you're God. And bask in your presence and hear your word and uh, just see what you have for us tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, chapter 3 of Genesis. And last time we saw the start of the fall, we only got through for, uh, the first seven verses of chapter three, so we're going to finish it tonight, and this is part two of the fall. But to get a running start, let's just start from verse one, because it's been a little while since we've been there. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Coverings, And that's where we left off right there as Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves, uh, cover their shame, cover their sin, and all of that, which is really not possible, right? Um, we all know that um, by now. And we're just getting a few verses here about the fall of man, really. I mean, it's just really a few verses. And it's easy to underestimate the seriousness of sin because of that. I mean, this is so serious that if God had not intervened, we would be separated from God forever. And so, because apart from God, we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are born into deadness, basically. That's why we need to be born again, right? Because we're born into deadness. So God's the only one who could solve this problem. But mankind as a whole 
is blinded to the seriousness of it. And that's why mankind parades his sin around town, basically, as if it's no big deal. So verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So notice God walked among them in the garden in the cool of the day. And the word cool is ruach, which is translated breath elsewhere or spirit elsewhere. Uh, here it means the cool breeze of the day, toward the end of the day, in other words. Uh, God is walking with them. Now, was this, is this a Christophany or a theophany? Is this an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament? That light's driving me crazy. <laughs> and uh, remember, God uh, uh, is spirit. So this very well could be Jesus walking among them in their midst, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, that he appeared in bodily form like theirs and fellowship with them, which he does several times throughout the Old Testament. And the language implies that this was a normal, everyday thing. So God did this all the time with Adam and Eve, and he went on a walk with them, basically, in a relaxed way. But notice, after the fall, they hid from the presence of God. And that's kind of funny, trying to hide from the presence of God. It's an impossibility. You really can't do it. And so now, because of the fall, they were afraid of God, and their fear drove them to run away rather than to come clean. Because sin separates us from God. Sin makes us want to run from God to hide our shame. I mean, that's the consequences of sin. We want to run from God. And even though they covered themselves, of course, that wasn't adequate. They still were afraid. They still were shameful. And they still wanted to hide. Remember, Adam was the most intelligent person who had ever lived. He was created perfectly. But what does sin do, do to us? It makes us stupid, right? The audacity to think that we can hide from God. That's, proud, that's pride. Because he knows all, he sees all, but we still try to outsmart him at times. Verse 9, and then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? Now, it's not that God didn't know where they were. He knew, you know, he wasn't looking on Google Maps trying to find them or anything like that. He knew where they were. He wanted them to fess up. He wanted them to confess. He was giving them opportunity to own it. And notice, who is seeking who here? God is seeking them. He is seeking, th they're hiding. They're running. But God is seeking after them. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Where are you? He's trying to get them to, to fess up. And that's the voice of a heartbroken father. Where are you? You ever say to your kids, what did you do? Knowing what they did the whole time, but wanting what? Wanting them to to own it, to, to fess up. And so here God says, where are you? Usually the kids pass the buck, and these kids are going to pass the buck too. Verse 10. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, did you notice what he didn't say? I ate of the tree. He said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Notice, it's an instinctive thing to hide when we do something wrong. It's instinctive to lie about it, to cover it up. Where do we get that from? Right here. We get it from right here. We get it from Adam. It was passed on to us. And notice why. Because I was naked, 
You mean he didn't realize he was naked? He's been naked since chapter 2. Now, all of a sudden, because I was naked, I had to hide myself. And so he didn't realize he was naked before this. In, in other words, there, there wasn't that shame in it. They were selfless until the fall. And now it's all about them. Now the ego kicks in. The pride kicks in. I mean, why do women wear makeup? Why do men try to look muscular? Why do we spend countless dollars on jewelry, on clothes, on shoes, on all of that stuff? It all goes back to this right here, guys. It all goes back to this. It's self-absorption. It goes back to the fall, and it's a cover-up. Literally. We're covering up. We're trying to cover our shame, cover ourselves. Verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? This is God talking. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat, just like a parent to a child? Right? Have you eaten from that tree? Own it. Own it. He's baiting. He has to bait Adam here to get him to fess up. Adam's just beating around the, the tree, so to speak. And, and he's making excuses, too. And so God is even giving him the word so that Adam would own it. Have you eaten from that tree I told you about? Come on, Adam. Come on. You could do it kind of a thing. And notice up front here that God has not addressed Eve at all up to this point. Adam, being the head of his family, is the problem. He's the responsibility. He knew what he was doing, but he did it anyway. Verse 12. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And so, of course, this is the start of the blame game. And it was an ingenious fleshly answer by Adam, really. Because he not only blames the woman, he also blames God in the same breath. The woman you put here with me, she gave it to me, and I ate. God, you're the one who said I shouldn't have been alone. Now look what happened. God, you made an error in giving me the woman. So it's the blame game, and it still goes on to this day. Where did we get it from? Right here. And notice the two, the man and the woman, who would become one flesh, are no longer. There's a separation going on. There's blame going on now. And that continues on. They, they've lost their harmony. Now they're blaming each other. But here's a curious thing, and I don't really have an answer for this. Did you notice who Adam didn't blame? Yeah, the serpent. He did not blame the serpent. I don't really know why. Uh, perhaps, maybe, uh, um, I mean, really, you would think that he would blame the serpent, too, because that's one more person to blame, right, to get it off of himself. But he doesn't. Perhaps Adam didn't mention the serpent because he wasn't directly deceived by him. Or maybe Adam wasn't even there when Eve was deceived. The language could mean that as well. Or maybe he's minimizing the deception of the serpent. I mean, I don't know, but it's conspicuous by its absence. Verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So now notice she joins the blame game. You know, he said, the woman made me do it. And she said, the serpent made me do it. And what she's saying here is, the devil made me do it. Right? And Flip Wilson made a lot of money on that phrase. But in defense of Eve, what she said here is true. The serpent did deceive her, and she ate. So in a sense, she is coming clean. Adam still isn't. She's actually stating what actually happened 
Of course, like God didn't already know, but she is coming clean. She's confessing it. Adam, on the other hand, hasn't admitted it yet. He said, instead, I was naked, so I hid. But there's that absence of the fact that I disobeyed your command. Verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, so Adam said, the woman. The woman said, the serpent. So now God says to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So Satan was originally the highest ranking angel, as we've talked about already, and he's now lower than all the earth's livestock and wild animals in God's view. He's the lowest of the low. He had already fallen, but this brings him to an all-time high and low. Notice God doesn't uh, ask the serpent any questions like he did with Adam and Eve. No questions, just judgment. And now, uh, because the serpent possessed some kind of an animal, he's compared to an animal, and God made him slither away on his belly, probably as some kind of snake at this point in time. On your belly you shall go. And this is why the snake has become a symbol of, of Satan. Adam and Eve must have been terrified when this happened. When they saw God judging the serpent, they had to think, uh-oh, we're next. It's going to come to us next. And how interesting it is that snakes today are a threat to humanity for the most part, many of them being poisonous. So it is a good symbol of the devil. Not that Satan is a reptile or anything like that, God was doing this as a symbolic act to show the perversity of the devil. He's a snake. Verse 15. And I will put enmity, or hostility, between you and the woman, between Satan, or the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed, your offspring, and her seed, capital S, who's that talking about? Jesus, right? And he, that is Jesus, shall bruise your head, literally crush your head. Remember, he's a snake. Crush your head. And you, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. And so here we have the first direct prophecy concerning Jesus Christ in the Bible. And Christian tradition has referred to this as protoevangelium. Uh, since it's been called the prototype for the, for the gospel, basically. And notice enmity between Satan's seed and Eve's seed. But the problem is a woman doesn't have seed, she has eggs. And seed is from the male, and it's singular here. We're talking about one seed that is the male component. So this is a reference to the virgin birth of Christ. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. And that seed was planted there by the Holy Spirit. And this is, so this is even hinting uh, to the virgin birth, the supernatural uh, virgin birth. And the seed of Satan, of course, would be Judas. Actually, many seeds of Satan, as we'll work through the Bible. But Judas specifically and ultimately the Antichrist. So all the way back here in Genesis 3, God lays out his plan of redemption. Satan bruised Jesus' heel by the betrayal and the crucifixion, but God would use that to crush Satan's head on the cross and ultimately, as we saw in Revelation, destroy him, throwing him in the lake of fire with, with the Antichrist and the false prophet. But this would explain, guys, why Satan has always tried to kill off the descendants of the woman. Because God told him that her seed would one day crush his head. Always tried to kill off the descendants of the woman because he knows that prophecy. So, and this first happened, by the way, in the very next chapter when Cain kills his brother, 
Abel. And we're going to continue to see examples of that over and over again. The flood. Satan had gotten mankind to the point of only one family was saved through it. And then we have the story of Esther with Haman. And again, trying to destroy the offspring. Uh, the offspring trying to destroy the Jews. One example after another, all the way to Herod, when he tries to kill all the male children, right? All the way to today with anti-Semitism. I mean, he's still at it, still trying to thwart that plan of God. And this is all happening because of this right here. So now God has dealt with Satan. Now back to the woman. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multi multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So before the curse, obviously there was no pain in childbirth at all. The rabbis believe that the real pain of bringing forth children is after the birth, not during the birth. In other words, raising kids is the real pain. Of course, none of them ever had children either. But the idea of that last phrase there, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you, the idea there is uh, that now the woman would have the desire to rule over the man. And the man will have the desire to rule over the woman. And the reason I say that, because it's a paradox, the word translated desire implier, implies to rule over. Because the only other place it appears is in the next chapter, in the Pentateuch, the same word. And it's when God said to Cain before he killed Abel that sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. It's the same word used. Sin desires to rule over, you see. So here, now the couple, man and woman, husband and wife, if you will, is going to be in competition instead of one flesh. The woman will try to rule and control the man, but the man's going to rule over the woman. It's the battle of the sexes, and it started right here. And it's quite a dilemma because, because of the curse, Eve would have to fight against the desire to rule over her husband, which, of course, would break God's plan. That's not how he designed it in the first place. But sin has corrupted the whole thing, and it's corrupted the willing submission of the wife and the loving headship of the husband. Consequently, both sides are abused. Because of it. Both are tainted with sin. And it's all part of the curse. So the struggles that we have in our marriages, the struggles we have in our relationships and all of that, it, that's all because of the curse. That's why it happens. Verse 17. Now back to Adam. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, Notice how God brings up the commandment. Adam didn't. God brings it up. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so now the ground is cursed. In other words, creation gets cursed because of Adam's sin. The Bible says that the whole creation waits for the redemption of man. And now for the man making a living would no longer be easy. Remember, God ordained work in the garden. He said to Adam, work the garden. Take care of the garden. But work wasn't toilsome. Now, man is going to have to work hard. And that's all because of the curse. And it's going to be toilsome. So the husband now has the desire to work and to provide and to conquer. The woman's desire is to rule, but in more of a relational style. And here we have the start of major difficulties between men and women. Women being more relational, the man being more um, utilitarian, I guess. 
And so now you have books like The Love Language and His Needs and Her Needs, understanding your personality. You know, what kind of personality do you have? Are you like a golden retriever? You know, are you like a, a bulldog, a poodle? Or women are from Venus, men are from Mars. And so the men need to learn how to speak Venetian, and the women need to learn how to speak Martian. And, you know, folks, some of those things are fun, and it's kind of a, a, a kick to go through them at times. But the reality is they will never truly work because the whole thing is cursed. They will never truly work because the whole thing is cursed. There's a divine curse on it. They may help you to understand things, but they're still not going to help the struggle. It's still going to be there because it's all cursed. What does work? What does fix the problem or help to fix the problem? Well, walking in the Spirit. That's it, walking in the Spirit, serving Jesus Christ, making him the center of your life. But it's not easy because the curse is there. And so we have to come to the realization that our spouse is never going to truly meet our needs. Only God can. It's disappointing, but it's real. And husbands will never find fulfillment in work or their wife or anything else because those, it's all cursed. Are you following that? So there's, there's false uh, fulfillments, but it's not real. It's not the real thing. And women will never truly find fulfillment in their husbands or their kids or work or anything else. True fulfillment comes from the Lord. And when God is at the center and the Holy Spirit is leading, well, then the whole thing starts to work. But as soon as we take our eyes off the Lord and we grieve the Spirit, it all starts to break down, doesn't it? And we see it in everyday life. Verse 18. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, that is, the ground will bring forth, and you shall eat the herb of the field. So thorns and thistles, weeds, are the result of the curse. And isn't it interesting how easily weeds grow? You don't have to water them. <laughs> you don't have to take care of them. Now try to get a garden to grow. Toil, sweat, you know, it's hard work. But weeds don't. And because weeds are a sign of the curse. And it's a reminder that things are not the way they're supposed to be. And it's interesting that Jesus bore the sign of the curse on his head when he was crucified. I talked about that a few weeks ago. A crown of thorns. Jesus was conquering the curse on the cross by becoming a curse himself. Did the Roman soldiers notice they know that they were fulfilling prophecy when they pushed that thing down on his head? No. They were unwilling participants in God's plan. But what a symbol of the curse being put on Jesus. And notice the consequences of sin affects everything. All of creation, not just Adam and Eve. Many believe even the laws of entropy were, were introduced when Adam and Eve fell. That everything started to break down. Everything started to fall apart. Rust, you know, everything wearing out. And part of God's redemption, though, is in the book of Revelation, where we see a new heaven and a new earth, and the laws of entropy are, are reversed. So there's the beginning of the book and the end of the book, where God reverses everything, and things will no longer decay and break down. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So God is in essence saying, I brought you into the world, and I can take you out. And so this is why it's so toilsome now to work. As I said, originally work was not hard. It was not toilsome before the curse. And in heaven, we're still going to work. But that toil, that sweat, all of that stuff is going to be taken away. 
And this is also why death takes place. On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They didn't die physically on the day they ate of it, but they did die spiritually. And eventually they would die physically as well. And so, to the ground you will go back, which is also cursed. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. So now Adam names the woman Eve. Eve means living or life giver. And I believe this is prophetic. I believe God has shown Adam that through Eve, the Messiah would come and deliver and rescue. And so he named her life giver accordingly. Remember, originally her name was Isha, weak or soft. But now her name is life giver. Adam is stepping out in faith here, I believe, looking forward to the Messiah. Verse 21. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So remember, they covered themselves with what? Fig leaves. But of course, those are totally inadequate. Because think about it, they're taking the leaves off the trees, making clothes out of them, and what's going to happen to the leaves? They're going to die. They're going to rot. They're going to turn into, you know, dry leaves and fall off, basically. But God clothes them with animal skins. Now an animal has to die in order to cover them. And I would lay odds, if I were a betting man, that the animal that God used was a lamb. Covered by the blood of the lamb. So now there's blood sacrifice in order to cover their shame. Now innocent lives have to shed their blood to, in order to cover them. And of course that is a foreshadow looking forward to Jesus Christ. So right up front, God is teaching them, okay, now you have to look forward to the Messiah. Now you have to believe in the Messiah and the blood of the Messiah, the Lamb of God who would one day take away the sin of the world. So here in Genesis, God is instituting the, the Levitical blood sacrifices right here. Over in Leviticus 17, 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So man has a blood disease, and it's fatal, and it's only by the perfect, untainted blood of Christ that he imputes to us. He makes us righteous that we can live. And that's why the writer to the Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's why you have to believe in Jesus. That's why you have to put your trust in Jesus. And I think, I think there's more to that than we understand right now. I think we're going to get, well, I think we're going to get more understanding in heaven about this. Because remember, when Cain kills Abel, God says that his blood is crying out to me. That's interesting to me. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Who's us? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? The Trinity. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So, in other words, God in his mercy ejected them out of the garden so that they wouldn't eat the tree of life in their fallen state and remain that way forever. God was actually protecting them here from eating from that tree and being cursed forever until he works out his redemption plan. So this is the mercy of God right here. Verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. 
Now, curious, why did God have to place a super angel there? Or plural, cherubim. That's plural. And cherubim, cherubs, were the highest ranking angels. Why did he need those to be there? Uh, you know, why was that needed? Adam and Eve could have been kept away by a regular angel. I want to suggest to you that they were guarding it from Satan, from the devil. Remember, Satan is also a cherub or a fallen cherub. And these angels needed to be powerful enough to deal with Satan so that he couldn't get to the tree of life and destroy it or pervert it somehow. Donald Gray Barnhouse writes this, Any angel of the lowest rank could have dealt with Adam. The flaming sword was pointed against Satan to keep him from destroying the way of access to the altar which God had set up. And remember, the cherubim uh, always have something to do with the throne of God. On the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim facing the mercy seat, which brings life. The blood was poured out on the mercy seat once a year for the sins of the nation, the blood of the Lamb. So here in the garden, the cherubim are guarding the tree of life, which brings life as God works out his plan of grace and mercy toward mankind. So the Garden of Eden, you know, probably deteriorated from the effects of the curse and then eventually was swallowed up during Noah's flood. Because remember, the flood changed the earth dramatically. However, we do see the tree of life show up again at the very end of the book. In chapter 22 of Revelation, where the nations can eat of it and be healed from it. And so the tree of life will show up again in the new heaven and the new earth. So paradise was given. Paradise was lost. And then paradise is going to be restored. There's the whole Bible, cover to cover. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, a, a, just a really a short chapter to deal with the fall of man. And then the rest of the book is going to deal with your redemption. That's pretty incredible. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of the Lamb. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you how that scarlet thread just is woven throughout the pages of your word. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Help us, Lord, to realize the seriousness of sin and to never take for granted what you did to solve that problem. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you love us, Lord, even when we're pretty unlovable. God, be with us the rest of this uh, day, Lord, and the rest of this week. Guide us and direct us, Lord. And we pray for your blessing on uh, Bill Harness for Sunday for his um, concert and singing, Lord. And be with his voice and be with his spirit, Lord. And may he be close to you, Lord, and connected to you. And may that just overflow to the church. So we pray for your special blessing on him, and your anointing on him, Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Peace.